important and they bring immediate, re immediate results when we live by them. But without this third rule, then the first two become increasingly impossible. The third rule is stay in love with God. And, and so it, th that's the foundation of our whole life. It is this vital relationship with God that helps enliven us, sustain us, guide us, and, and it helps us as we're called, sent, and transformed and renewed in the name of God. The writer of Psalm 127, he declared that unless the Lord builds the house, those who build will build in vain, labor in vain. So what, what he's saying is when we practice these rules, then God sends his power to us, so it enables us to keep these rules. Uh, we practice the rules, and God does all he can to help us complete these rules by transforming and renewing us and helping to build the house of our lives, to build the house of our church, to build the house of the world. Only living in this, uh, only living in that healing, loving relationship, uh, redeeming and forming, guiding relationship in life and presence of God, that will we be able to redeem and heal and transform as we go out into the world and receive all that we need so desperately from God? That is why staying in love was the the next, the third rule that John Wesley brought up. He wanted the people called Methodists. To stay in love with God. And he believed that the way that they did that, the means of doing that, was through the ordinances of God. The ordinances were those things that Wesley identified as being required of God's people. And Wesley names these things as the ordinance of God. An ordinance sounds like a strange word to us, unless we do a lot of city business. But ordinance, uh, these ordinances, these were practices that kept our relationship between us and God and other humans alive, vital, and growing. Wesley names them as public worship uh, of God, the Lord's Supper, private and family prayer, searching the scriptures, Bible study, and fasting. Or in other words, we, uh, another title we give to these things are the means of grace, which we talked about in a series earlier this summer as we talked about the means of grace that allow us to do what we can for our world. Together, these means of grace, they give us, these are essential spiritual disciplines that give us these practices that bring us closer to the life-giving source of our guidance, of our protection, of our love. And so Wesley saw that these disciplines were central to a life that was lived in faithfulness to God in Christ. Wesley believed that we needed to stay in touch with Christ, with the presence and power of Christ in our lives for us to be able to live the lives that God desires of us as faithful disciples. In other words, spiritual disciplines help us uh, keep in love with God. They help us to stay in love with God as we are continually, daily, working to build that relationship with God. For Wesley, these spiritual disciplines were central to any life that we were to lead in faithfulness to God and Christ and the Holy Spirit. Wesley found that attending to these ordinances was also encouraged scripturally. He found it, especially in the second chapter of Colossians, where it says this, As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him and established in faith just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Jesus, when, when we live a life rooted in Jesus, we try to follow the example of Jesus that he led in his life as he went about uh, doing his ministries and missions in the world. Sister Joan Chis Chittister, she puts it this way in her book, uh, Illuminated Life. She says, all we have in life is life. Things like cars, houses, education, jobs, money, they come and go. They turn to dust between our fingers. They change and they disappear. The secret of life is that it must be developed from the inside out. These spiritual disciplines were important because they teach us how to live in harmony with something larger than ourselves, larger than just the values of this world, and deeply in touch with the love and the mystery that is our God. Uh, reminding us that as we grow closer and closer to God throughout our lives and throughout these daily practices, 
practices of these spiritual disciplines that we will never completely know the heart and mind of God, but that we are to keep striving to know that heart and mind of God and to keep deepening our love for God. The late Bishop Reuben Job, he put it this way in his book, Three Simple Rules. It says, living in the presence of and in harmony with the living God, who is made known in Jesus Christ and companions us in the Holy Spirit, is to live life from the inside out. It is to find our moral direction, our wisdom, our courage, our strength, to live faithfully from the one who authored us, called us, sustains us and sends us into the world as witnesses who daily practice the way of living uh, with Jesus. Spiritual disciplines keep us in that healing, redeeming presence and power of God that forms and transforms each of us more and more into the image of the one we seek to follow. Each day as we practice these spiritual disciplines, it help us to, helps us to grow more and more like Christ in our lives, to stay closer and deeper in relationship with God. These practices, they keep us positioned in such a way that deep within we hear God's soft whisper and his promises to us. We, we hear his forgiveness of us when we sin. We hear his direction and his will for our Lives. These practices not only keep us in love with the one who loves us the most, but they help us to hear God, to trust in God, and then to respond to God with all we are. Therefore, the faithful people of God are those who keep these disciplines, not in a regimented or rote fashion, but as a way of expressing and experiencing the love of God and the love of neighbor by which Jesus named the highest commandments of all. We are to love God with all we are and to love our neighbors. And 1 John tells us that for the love of God is this, that we obey God's commandments. So if we want to love God, we have to follow God's commandments. The problem is that we don't, it's not that we don't know that. We don't, it's not that we don't know we're supposed to love God and love each other. Uh, we've heard that from the very moment we began this faith journey, right? The problem is that we have a, a bit of an issue understanding or we get confused about this love thing. In American culture, love is a messy thing. It, it's emotional, it's flighty, it's dependent on our circumstances, it's subject to our moods and our desires. Love is messy in American culture. But the prevailing conception of love in America it's kind of like a lot of other theories we have, including democracy. It's fine in theory, but it doesn't always hold up. It doesn't always hold up, and we know that. We experience that. We see that in the dramas and the comedies we see on our TVs, in the songs that we hear sung about love, in, the, in all of the ways that we see love in our world. But it bears remembering that when we're talking about love, we're not talking about love the way we define it, but the way God defines it as a God they love, unconditional, unmerited love for all. And it bears repeating. So let's look back at 1 John 4, 7 through 12. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God. For God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In, his, in this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. Too much? Not enough, if you ask me. We really ought to read the entire chapter of 1 John, uh, 1 John 4. That, it's an amazing chapter. John has so much wisdom to share with us. But yet, better yet, we should be reading the whole of 1 John. Yeah, better even yet than that, we should be reading the whole of the gospel because what is the gospel about? That God's love for us, that God loved us so much that he sent his son to come reside among us, to suffer just all, all of the same things that we suffer, to die for us, and then to give us. 
that God has for his creation. These verses indeed seem like old news to us. We've heard it all before. But look even deeper into it and listen to that basic declaration that John makes here. God is love. Now that's a pretty amazing, and really when you think about it, that's a pretty profound statement. God is love. Now John could have said that God is many things. He could have said God is power, God is justice, God is the unknowable and ineffable mystery of the universe. He could have used many words to describe God. But what does he use? He says God is love. He doesn't say that God loves or that God is the source of love, but God is love. God is love. That, that's fundamental essence of God. The fundamental essence is love. And it boggles your mind when you think about the fact that the basic essence of God is love. But John isn't done with just this earth-shattering statement. No one has seen God. If we love one another, then God lives in us. Think about that. God lives in us because love lives in us. Not that we love, and, and this is one of those and, and, and hold your hat kind of things, For if we love one another, God lives in us. Not, not out there somewhere, but in us. And his love is perfected in us. And you're thinking, that sounds pretty good. Love perfected in us. But then we start to think, no, that can't be. We're human. We don't love like that. Our love isn't perfect. Perfection, that's God. That's part of our fundamental theology of God is that God is perfect. And so God's love has to be perfect. But in us, perfected, perfect? No, maybe if I were Wonder Woman and you were a Superman, but we're human. There's nothing perfect about it. We've experienced, we've been hurt too many times by this thing called love. We, we, we know that, that we've been wrong many times with this thing called love. We know we've been rejected and tossed aside and then lost because of this thing we call love. We're hardly perfect. We stumble, we run out of energy, we run out of hope. We forget about what love truly is and what it's about. Perfect? No, we're not even close. Not even close. But what John Wesley wants to remind us of, what John is reminding us of, what the, all of this is reminding us, is that this love thing, it's a process. It's a process that goes on every day of our lives. Every day, as John Wesley would say, we are going on to perfection. It's a process where we are moving forward every day of our lives, trying to get a little closer and a little closer and a little closer to that perfection. And many of us sometimes feel like we're on the scenic route, and we're still a long way out from where we're going to get to that, that idea of being perfect. We, we just don't seem to grasp this whole love thing very well. We have trouble with loving the people that are close to us, the, the ones that we like, and yet love those ones that we don't like. Uh, how about the ones in the rest of the world, the ones that are different from us, the ones that disturb us, the ones that we don't even understand? How in the world are we supposed to love them? And what if they don't love us back? Isn't that the way love's supposed to be? That we're loved and then we get love back? Aren't there winners and losers in this love game? Uh, yet, what if it's not really a game? What if we started thinking about this love thing as not a game, but as love for love's sake? The love for having God within us. Love in order so that God can take up residence in our heart. And so that God can shine through us. That, that we might have the boldness to allow God to take up residence in, in our homes, in our lives, in everything we do. And John tells us that perfect love is love that never ends. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in the world. That is what we are striving, to be more like Christ, to be like Christ, when that judgment day comes. Listen to 
the scripture, this message from 1 John 4 in the message. It says this, God is love. And when we take up, when we take up permanent residence in a life of love, we live in God and God lives in us. This way, love has the run of the house, becomes at home and matures in us so that we are free of worry on judgment day. Our standing in the world is identical with Christ. There is no room in love or fear. Well-formed love banishes fear, since fear is crippling. A fearful life, fear of death, fear of judgment is not yet fully formed in love. That love becomes so much a part of us that we no longer fear all those things the devil tries to place in our lives to help us to feel that fear of what's going to happen if we're rejected or if, if something happens or what if we're not good enough. Love takes all of those things and it rids us of them since fear cripples us and help, doesn't help us to live a God-honoring life. Love never gives up. Even when love hurts, even when it seems futile, God, love is eternal. It, it, it is there to cast out our fears. And in the end, when God, the innocent, inexhaustible source of love, abides in us, then God enables us to love in that same way, to love freely, without any fear. Holy living won't be discovered, achieved, or continued, or sustained without us staying in love with God. While staying in love with God means that we have to be involved in prayer and worship and Bible study and the Lord's Supper. And it involves us tending, the, uh, feeding the lambs and tending the sheep and helping with people's needs in this world. It's a process. It's a way of living that guards our lives against the evil out there in the world and enables us to do good for those around us. A way of living that provides a way to stay in love with God in this world and in the next. Now, Wesley knew that this was a process, that it was a work in progress, that we had to work on every day, day by day, every day of our lives. And even then, we would sometimes feel so far away and lose sight of what love is. But the fact is that those who follow these three simple rules and who practice and who practice their world, their world will be changed forever, and so will the world around them. It will enable them to claim their heritage as children of God. John tells us in, in chapter 5 that we can conquer the world with this love. We can conquer the world with God's love, with this discipline, with this faith that we have in Jesus Christ. We can conquer the world. Think about it, people. Conquer the world. The world inside of us and the world around us. That's what we're working toward as we practice these ordinances of God, is to change our world, to help God's kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven. And we need to keep ourselves deeply rooted in these dis disciplines of faith so that we can continue to grow in love, to grow in love with God and to grow in our love for one another. We need to abide in Christ as he abides in us. For if we do not know love, we do not know God. Amen? Amen. All right, your questions for today. What comes to mind when you think of staying in love with God? John 15, 1 through 11 reminds us that we are interwoven and we're connected to each other and God. Why is that connection to each other important? How do we connect to those who may not walk with us in our daily lives? And what other scriptures come to mind when you think about staying in love with God? And how do we live this out, this idea of staying in love with God? I have seven practical steps we can look at. Number one, recognize your inner desire for a deeper relationship with God. Number two, prayer is our direct line to God. So develop a stronger prayer life. Number three, study the Bible. The Bible is our guidebook for life. And it has timeless wisdom and divine truth for all of us. Number four, live out the word. Studying the Bible is essential, but it's not enough. We also must put that, what we're learning, into action. Number five, have fellowship with other believers because that's crucial to experiencing more of God. 
Number six, embrace God's will. To experience more of God, we have to embrace and learn to embrace what God's will is for us. And lastly, cultivate an attitude of gratitude. Gratitude is an essential element of a vibrant spiritual life. 